Every competitive Pokemon player has a metagame that is special to them. Whether it's because it was their first, or because they enjoy its balance, or because their favorite Pokemon is viable in it. There's something about that metagame which just speaks to the soul. It might be a metagame throughout all its bans, unbans, and general metagame developments, or it might be a very specific period. For example, several players absolutely love the Gen 4 OU metagame when both Latias and Salamence were allowed. Today we're examining perhaps the wildest of such metagames, Dream World OU which took place during Generation 5. So you may be wondering, what is a dream world? Well, in Generation 5, Pokemon were found to have hidden abilities, many of which were game changers that went on to become defining traits of their recipients. To name but a few, Speed Boost Blaziken, Rough Skin Garchomp, Magic Guard Alakazam, Poison Heal Gliscor, Multi-Scale Dragonite, Regenerator Slow Twins, Unaware Quagsire, and of course in Generation 5, nothing shaped OU more than Drizzle Politoed and Drought Ninetales. The dream world is where these abilities came from. Now, not all of these hidden abilities were released at the same time. While Drought Tales and Drizzle Toad, among many others, kicked Gen 5 right off, some, like Magic Guard Alakazam and Prankster Sableye, didn't come around until the last few months of Black and White 1. Others, like Technician Breloom and Sheer Force Lanterns Incarnate, weren't released until Black and White 2. Some, like Contrary Superior, were never released in Generation 5, having to wait until Generation 6 for that. Finally, some, like Shadow Attack Shannon Allure, were never released at all. Despite these hidden abilities not being available, they were known to exist, and people understandably wanted to play with them. Thus, Dream World OU was born, in which every Pokemon had access to their hidden abilities. In this sense, Dream World OU would be considered a kind of precursor or spiritual companion to the National Dex format. The main difference being, of course, that Dream World OU was theoretically possible in the games. It was meant to give you a glimpse of what could be in the future. So let's dive into what the metagame itself was like. Dream World OU was mostly played throughout Black and White 1. In Black and White 2, almost everything was released, and the metagame took a nosedive in popularity, ceasing to have almost any interest. You might wonder, was there much difference if everything known to exist was allowed anyway? The answer is yes, there was, since not everything in Black and White 2 was known to exist before. The most notable example is Ethereum Forms. They straight up did not exist, even in a hidden capacity in Black and White 1, to the point where you can't even trade these Ethereum Forms from Black and White 2 to Black and White 1 because the latter games don't have them coded in. Back then, the incarnate forms of the genies were the only forms, and thus their incarnate forms weren't even referred to as such. They were simply Landorus, Thunderous, and Tornadus. In a similar vein, the Kirin forms did not exist either. In addition to not having these alternate forms, Dream World OU being played in Black and White 1 was relevant as it predated important Black and White 2 move tutors. This notably meant Exodus couldn't Iron Head, Poison Hill Gliscor couldn't Roost, Conkeldur couldn't Ice Punch, and Terrakion couldn't Stealth Rock. Now for the fun stuff, which is of course the slew of threats that were allowed in Dream World OU. Since all sorts of hidden ability beasts were unleashed, it seemed appropriate that several monsters previously banned from OU would be allowed, as they would theoretically be less overwhelming, at least comparatively, in this freakishly high-powered setting. These monsters were Manaphy, Blaziken, Garchomp, which had been banned for Sandvale Antics, as Sandvale itself wasn't banned until Black and White 2, Thunderous Excadrill, which had been banned for Sand Rush in Permanent Sand, but was now back at full power, and Deoxys Speed. Also allowed were several Pokemon that were known to be in the game, but were yet to be released. Genesec, Meloetta, and Keldeo. These monsters were hugely defining pieces of the metagame. Well, maybe not Meloetta so much, but certainly the others. Just like in regular OU, Sand, Rain, and Deoxys offenses were ferocious, except amped up to obscene levels. Imagine Rain teams running Manaphy and Thunderous, while Sand teams packed both Excadrill and Sand Veil Garchomp. And Deoxys offense wasn't just bolstered by its fact that it could run the speed form, as opposed to the defense form still allowed in OU proper at the time. It also loved the fact that once its hazard had been set, it had bigger threats to unleash on the opponent, most notably Blaziken. It is at this point, however, that we must mention the most defining facet of the tier the Pokemon with the hidden abilities, many of which would go on to become familiar faces in OU proper. We'll start with a trio of grass types. Technician Braylon was quite a threat. While additionally, in Dream World, one of its best qualities was packing a powerful Mach Punch capable of revenge killing Excadrill in the sand. Next, Contrary Superior was an utter terror, especially since in Gen 5 its Leaf Storms were 140 base power, not the 130 they'd be lower to in Generation 6 and later. Finally, Regenerator Amoongus held the tier together against many an offensive onslaught, including that of the two previous Pokemon. There were several other notable picks as well. No matter what threat you were facing, you could check it with a Choice Scarf and Poster Ditto. Water absorbed Suicune, which was sadly never released, turned strong water moves into negative while also taking on Excadrill and Garchomp and even posing a threat itself. Sheer Force Landorus was somewhat overlooked but those who used it quickly became acquainted with the power that would later devastate OU. The absolute king of hidden ability Pokemon though, and the single best, most defining force of Dream World, 
was a beast thankfully never unleashed upon OU. Shadow Tag Chandler. From day one of Gen 5, players argued that Shadow Tag Shandy should never spend a day in OU. Shadow Tag is already an insanely broken ability on otherwise terrible Pokemon like Wobbuffet and Gothitelle, but on a Pokemon with Fire Stab and a special attack stat approaching Kyogre, yeah, not a chance. In Dream World OU, this theory was explicitly proven over and over and over. Never had there been a metagame with a higher concentration of Shed Shells. Oh, but Chandler was weak to Tyranitar in its pursuit, yeah, but if Chandler got its trap off beforehand, as it pretty much always did if its user was halfway competent, the damage was done. Chandler was particularly absurd because of how easily it supported Pokemon that were already overwhelmingly difficult to deal with, like Blaziken, Garchomp, and Excadrill, sending them into truly unmanageable territory. Forcing Pokemon like Skarmory to run Shed Shell was already a win, let alone the sand effect of Amoongus. But then you add the fact that with Hidden Power Ice, Chandler utterly destroys Gliscor. Oh, and it's also immune to Breloom's Mock Punch, so it ruins that revenge killing option too. It could be customized to do whatever you wanted, pretty much. Want to guarantee you win the weather war against rain? Specs Energy Ball will smack Polito perfectly. With Specs, the need for Hidden Power Ice goes down, so you can run Hidden Power Ground instead, blasting Heatran so that your Superior can sleep, or your Chlorophyll Venusaur for that matter, because, oh yeah, Sun was also very much a threat. Some of Blaziken, Chlorophyll Venusaur, Chandelure, and Dugtrio on top of that, absolutely absurd. There was an overflowing abundance of powerful team styles in Dream World OU. Deoxys Speed Offense, Sun Offense, Rain Offense, Sand Offense. That's a lot of offense, of course, but Sand Stall was also viable and successful. Mostly because it was anchored by Sand Rush Excadrill, revenge killing everything and sweeping frail offense late game. Of course, beyond these defined styles, there was a lot of in-between types of teams. Mostly offense. As utterly chaotic as the metagame was, it showed one of the greatest things about Pokemon. Chaotic metagames breeding creative answers to overpowered threats. In this case, one such answer was Technician Hitmontop, or Technitop, known for its assortment of priority. Fake out a Mach Punch were boosted by Technician, and Fake Out was a free hit, while Sucker Punch at base 80 power in Generation 5 was plenty strong on its own. Here was Hitmontop's niche. It had the strongest stab Technician Mach Punch for Excadrill, Alabrelum, but unlike Loom, its Sucker Punch meant it couldn't be revenge killed by Chandelier, as it would knock it out with Stealth Rock. Plus, with how offensive most teams were, they were perfect prey for Technitop. Their speed was bypassed and their frail members were hit hard by its strong, general all-purpose priority. Mach Punch dealt heavy damage to Pokemon like Blaziken, Genesect, and Superior as well, especially when boosted by Fighting Gem or Life Orb. Even against fighting resistant Pokemon like Thunderous and Venusaur, Fake Out and Sucker Punch helped pick them off nicely. Technitop was largely forgotten after Gen 4 UU, unless you played Dream World OU, where it was excellent. All things considered, Dream World OU was surprisingly bad balance, relative to the complete anarchy you might expect anyway. More than that though, it was incredibly fast paced, exciting, and fun. It was a bunch of monstrous Pokemon trading KOs with each other, well other than when you faced Sandvale Garchomp, which would take all the KOs for itself while dodging your 100% accurate moves in return. The variety and possibilities were endless, maybe in the future, Gen 5 Dream World OU will have to be played, on the ladder, in a tournament, or just for fun. Anything for this wildest of metagames. If you did enjoy this discussion video, consider subscribing. I upload these 3-4 to four times a month and I upload competitive Pokemon every single day. Check out my previous video on why Toxapex is the most hated Pokemon.